Hello, I, I, I'm Alberto and I'm the file shape guy. Uh, so file shape is something I started, I developed with Florian um, uh, some years ago, I don't remember when. Uh, and I can guarantee you that Florian may have written, yesterday I heard he wrote some bad code in somewhere. <laughs> but in, in file shape he did an amazing job, so, so don't worry about it. So, Maybe it doesn't work with PDFs. All right. Okay. So first of all, what is shape optimization in one slide? Uh, just an example. Imagine there is you're, you're you're sitting here or you're standing here and you're shooting with a laser at this point, and then there's like there's like a lens in the middle, and then you have learned in A level physics. I, I've never taken A level, so I, I don't know, but I suppose that you learn these things. That uh, a lens uh, creates focuses light. Okay, this is how glasses work. And so you, you just do it and then light gets focused in one region. In A-level physics, maybe you say it's one point, but it's not a point, it's a region. And uh, for whatever application, you would like this not to be here, but maybe to be closer to the surface because it's nice. Then what you can do, you can do it in many ways, but one way to do it is to change uh, you see the laser? No. To change the geometry of your shape so that the focus is where you want it. Okay, so shape optimization is about this. You have some initial shape that does not do what you want, and so you change it so that it does what you want, hopefully. Okay, so in these 15 minutes or so, I, what I give is just like, first of all, a very, very, very short introduction to what is shape optimization mathematically. And, uh, and then we're gonna switch like what's new in file shape. It's about this spine wavelets. And then I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about an ongoing industrial application. So shape optimization is an optimization problem and you have essentially two ingredients. You have a search space, okay, a set of candidates. And then you have a function that takes candidates, in this case shapes, and gives it real numbers. 1, 2, 3, 25, and so on. And what you want to do is you want to find the shape that returns the smallest number. Okay, that's shape optimization, that's any optimization problem. Now, the difficult thing in shape optimization is to characterize the collection of admissible shapes. Okay, because when the biggest difficulty is that shapes are not naturally part of a, of a vector space. You cannot take two shapes and add them up. To, to, it's not clear what it means. And so this is where the various, um, this is where the, the shape optimization community splits. Depending on how you characterize this collection of admissible shapes, you get a different method. You get the sim, you get the level set method, you get a phase field method, or you get what I do, which is a, a method of deep homomorphisms. So the idea is the following. You start with your initial shape, and then to create new shapes, you take deep homomorphisms, so sufficiently regular bijections of the space, and you apply them to your initial shape. So you apply it once, you get one shape, you apply another transformation, you get another shape, and so on. Okay, so this way, you can, you can you start with one and you can get many, essentially. Uh, you can control how regular they are by just deciding how regular these transformations may, must be. But uh, also very importantly, this way you identify shapes with transformations. And now this is nice because transformations, these are just vector functions. So these belong to a function state and then this is nice, we, can, we, have a, we have a lot of structure, we, we, we know what we have to do in this case. And also maybe uh, the very nice thing that, so why do I like this method? I like this method because this is very, very much compatible with finite elements. So this is essentially how parametric finite elements work. So that's very nice. So using this, this, this interpretation shape transformation, what you can do is that you, you can take the original problem and just like rephrase it. You have an initial domain, you have some admissible transformation, you have a function that takes a transformation <coughs> and gives it a number. 
And then now what you want to do is you want to find the best transformation. And the way you solve this problem in practice is uh, iteratively you use some optimization method and what happens is essentially you start with the identity and then you just like update your transformation iteratively using steepest descent, BFGS, or trust region, or whatever you want. Now, this works very well with FileDrake, and, and, and this is why FileShape exists, probably. Because in FileDrake, you can do something like this. You can, you can take a mesh, you can define a vector function space on that mesh, you can create a function that is in this vector function space, and then you can create a new mesh using this function. Okay, through recording the field. But now this T, uh, this is fantastic because now once you, you have created this thing, if you change T afterwards, you change the mesh. Okay, so like this, is, this T lives inside this new mesh. You can access it, you can modify it. And so you can do, you can do exactly this thing and get the corresponding meshes. So this, was, this is very useful, and then this is why file shape is possible, essentially. So we just built, uh, we just put like all the, all the tools uh, or all the useful functions around this concept to the point that now when you, if you want to solve a shape optimization problem with file shape, what you have to provide is you need, you need to give the code that evaluates this function j. So if, if this depends on a PD, has a PD constraint, you also need to pro put that into it. But that's like essentially anything you can solve with file rate, it's fine. And then what you have to do is you have to decide um, what type of uh, vector function space you want to use to, to describe your shapes. You need to choose an inner product. This is, uh, I'm gonna explain this a bit more in the next slide, but this is, because when you do optimization, you need to do optimization in a, in a Hilbert space, so you need to decide how to compute gradients. And finally, it's for the optimization algorithms, we just use ROL. So everything is, is packed, packaged in such a way that you just decide which ROL solver you want to use for the optimization and, and, and go. So about this gradient stuff, and this is where then this plan where rates come into, into uh, into, into the game. So this function that gives you, give, assigns real values to shapes um, is defined in a closed subspace of a Banach space. So its derivative is an element of the dual space of this Banach space. So this is a function in dual to compute the, to, to, to find an update. What you need to do is you need to find you need to use this dj tilde to define to find a dt, essentially. And now the pragmatic way. So this is a Banach space. It's not a Hilbert space. So here there is like some some choices that you do. But in practice, what you do is just like you pick an inner product that you decide which one, and then you just compute the least representative of this operator in the inner product, and then this gradient j you use it either directly as dt, or if you do BFGS, you combine it with previously computed gradients to do this dt, essentially. All right, and now what I want to stress, because I wanted to segue, segue into, into these lines, is that a Hilbert space is two things. It's a vector space, and it, it's endowed with, a, with an inner product, okay, that may, and then you can take a completion of that. But you can mix and match, okay, so you can, you can consider different, different vector spaces and different inner products and, and construct different spaces. And this and the, 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 this by wavelets are another vector space. Okay, or, or it's, it's, it's a different basis for the vector space. So one vector space that you can choose is one spanned by B spline. So this is a spline space. It does not live directly in FireDrake, but we use an interpolator to switch from the B spline space to a finite to a finite element space, and 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 then we put we we put this in and, uh, and we made it work, and so this, this was already available. The nice thing of using B splines is that you can easily get very very smooth discretization, 
compared to standard finite elements, is much easier, uh, especially on Cartesian domains. And uh, the other nice thing is that the discretization that you have uh, for the transformation is independent or deca completely decoupled from the mesh that you use to evaluate J, which is the one that you may use to, uh, uh, to solve a, a state constraint equation. And this could be useful uh, if you encounter like some regularization issues and so on. Now, the, the, the annoying part is that you need to have this transfer operator that goes from the spline space to the, to the, to the, uh, to the finite element space, and that's uh, memory consuming. The, like, the only way to do it efficiently is like construct it and store it, and then you need to have it there. And that's a big piece. And now, these uh, plane wavelets are is essentially it's a new basis for the same space of these plants. So what you have to do is you need to you take these these plants that I showed you before, so functions that look like this. So for each for each uh, for each uh, point here, you have one of these. And you recombine them, you do linear combination of them, and construct a different basis. Okay, so you construct exactly the same space, but it's a different basis. When I say cleverly, you, you need to be really clever. Like, the way to do it, like, the like I'm hiding a lot of the difficulty in this. It, it's, it has been done by other researchers, but implement, finding out how to do it in the end and, and, and doing it uh, to two, PhD, two master students. So first Vincent, did, uh, did it just for B-spline, B-spline wavelets, and then Rending recently brought the B-spline wavelets into file shape. Okay, so it's really technical. But it's doable. And, and, and then you get a, a basis that has a lot of some, like, some interesting properties. First of all, these wavelets are compactly supported, which will be useful for something. Uh, then the basis is also hierarchical, which means if you want to refine the space, you can Retain everything you have, and you just add some extra basis functions. You don't need like a, to throw away everything and, and start from scratch. And uh, and it's uniformly stable. So uniformly stable. Uh, I'm not going to explain exactly what it means, but uh, I explain why it's useful. Okay. So when you want to compute the gradient, you need to discretize essentially this inner, this inner product. You need to Take um, in the, it's like solving a, a Poisson equation. You need to discretize the the Laplacian essentially, no? And when you do it, you get a matrix. And if you just like take standard finite elements for the Laplacian, the condition number grows as you refine. Okay. If the basis is stable, the condition number is independent on the discretization. Okay. You can take a coarse discretization, a fine discretization, the condition number is bounded by a constant that is independent on how many functions you're using. And so this means that when you want to solve, when you want to solve this uh, gradient equation to compute the gradient, uh, you can use an iterative method and you don't have to worry about preconditioning in theory. Because the method, the met it's inherently when conditioned. So here is just some example. So this four, five, six, seven, Think of uniform refinement, okay? For level like, um, there's a reason why it starts with four and not with one, but it's not important. And so what you get, these are like, this is the square root of the condition number, which is uh, the factor that, uh, that you, the contraction, uh, it's related to what you need for a uh, conjugate gradient, okay? So if it's big, it's bad, if it's small, it's nice. Ideally it's one, but I mean, <laughs> we live in the real world. And, and so for like, what is interesting here is that probably the, for the H2 case, you know, you get like 21. And 21 is not a big number. Okay, so this is, this is quite useful. Two minutes, okay. I'm gonna start speaking very, very quickly now. <laughs> no, no. And the other thing is, is it allows adaptivity. Um, this way, this, this plane well it's a, a lot of adaptivity. So the idea is the following. If you take a, this is a basis, this, the basis of spline wavelets. If you take a function, you can express this function with respect to this basis. Now, because this baby, this basis is uh, is uh, locally supported and and uniformly stable, what you have 
is you have local coefficient decay. So if your function is locally smooth, the coefficient associated with the spline wavelet with support in that region will decay very fast. Okay? So this means that if you, if you consider this expansion, you can truncate it and still retain a very good approximation. So one way to do it is just to decide, okay, once I have this expansion, I'm just gonna keep the first uh, that many uh, coefficients um, in order to preserve the norm of the object that I have constructed. So you have a function, you, you can construct an approximation by truncating this expansion so that you get retain 90% of the original norm. And this allows you to chuck away a lot of coefficients and here is a, an example that shows why this would enable an adaptivity, although we haven't implemented the adaptive method. So here what we do is we do optimization. Uh, in, in theory, we have like 2,000 basis functions, but every time we compute this gradient, we chuck away everything that is small, okay? We end up using uh, one-eighth of the coefficients, and we could still solve the problem to the same accuracy. I'm not showing the comparison, but you, you trust me, the message here is that you could do this thresholding and, and even if you just take it just like one-eighth of the gradient to compute these updates, it would still work very well, which means that you could, you, you could do some adaptivity in that you just like, you, you start with 250 and then you just add basis functions where needed. But we haven't really done that. Okay, and then just like a final minute, um, I want to just advertise uh, an, 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 an industrial collaboration that, that I'm doing with FlexServe. So you may have already seen this thing. If you go to coffee shops, you can get hot, hot food. Now, if you look at the brand of, the, of, of this thing, it's FlexServe. So like they're like the leader. And what they want to do is now they want to improve their designs uh, using simulation. So there's two projects. One, this ICMS has started on the 1st of September, and this is the more matzy one. This is where five and five shape will play a bigger role. But this one is more like using commercial software. That's the design of the container, not the food, right? It's the consign, yeah, it's, we, are, we are designing the cabinet. <laughs> the cabinet, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so just a few things, you know. Um, so the, the simulation. What they do is quite, this is just, not, it's not any secret, this you can infer from the website. So the way it works, it recirculates hot hair. So like, you heat hair in the back, it goes, comes from the front, and then it's sucked in from this ventilation. So you, you, you reuse the same hot hair to keep the food warm. And um, so there's many things you can optimize here, not like how quickly you, you suck the, the air and how much you heat it and the shape of this thing or the shape of the thing. Uh, and a few things here I wanted uh, to advertise uh, Joe work because in principle the equations that you need to solve here are the conjugate heat transfer equations which means that for the air you use some like average Reynolds uh, nearest Stokes equations and then to transfer heat from the, from the air to the to solid it's, it's a conjugate uh, uh, heat transfer which would require solving two PDEs on two subdomains, which was always a big problem, but it looks very much like uh, Joe's work uh, enables for the first time to solve uh, PDEs on, on subdomains. Uh, you not Ruben, not just not Ruben, <laughs> apologies, apologies, Ruben's work allows you to solve PDEs on subdomains with fine rate, and so this won't be a problem anymore. So I just end with some requests for the community. Um, if you have any good uh, Reynolds average uh, Navier Stokes solvers in your hard drive, uh, please uh, share it with me. <laughs> I'll be very happy to use it. And the other thing that I think looks quite challenging is that um, this, this design uses something called um, a, an air curtain. So what it does is shoots air from the front to prevent cold air from coming in. Now, how do you simulate that? I'm very happy to have a discussion. Okay, and this is everything. Many thanks for your attention.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you mean the company? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, so, uh, I guess it's a question to everybody, not just that I think you might be able to help me with it. it um, can I now solve a uh, problem on one mesh, interpolate it to another one, solve a problem over there, and then have a functional which involves both of those meshes? Oh, so, hell yeah. Okay, I will have a chat with you. And it's, so, I mean, it's, it's not me. I know. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's Ruben yeah, and, we, and Dave. Yeah, we need to buy them a lot of them. But also, <laughs> maybe let me, let me say it out loud. <laughs> out, out loud. Yeah. Pi adjoint compatible. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you can I, optimize. I, I'll talk to you later because I've got an idea. Okay, mm -hmm. so, congratulations. <laughs>